Hey, what's up, Ken peeps? It is free response time. A student adds 150 milliliters of a 0.030 molar lead to nitrate solution to 125 milliliters of 0.100 molar potassium iodide solution. A chemical reaction takes place and a precipitate is formed. Ooh, sounds solid. Part A, write the balanced equation for the reaction, including states. Okay, so here we're going to lean on our good friend's reference materials. We've got this list of polyatomic ions to help us write the formulas. But remember, when it comes to those states of matter, we're also going to look at these solubility rules to help us identify whether or not those things will be aqueous or whether they'll be solid, insoluble precipitates. All right, so our two reactants are lead to nitrate and potassium iodide. So as I work to write this, I'm going to write the formulas first and then worry about balancing. So lead two means that the lead ion has a plus two charge. Nitrate, remember, we don't have to memorize that. It's on our list of polyatomic ions, NO3 with a minus one charge. When those come together, it's going to be PbNO3 two. Now, I'm given a clue here, it's a solution, so I know that it's aqueous already, but it's always important to kind of maybe check your list of solubility rules if you're unsure. Nitrate, anything that has nitrate in it is gonna be very soluble. So aqueous to start for our lead to nitrate. Next, we've got potassium iodide. That's what we're mixing it with. Again, another solution. This one's a little easier. It's just potassium and iodide plus one and minus one. So those are going to come together in a one to one ratio for our formula. Again, aqueous solution, but you can confirm by looking at your list of solubility rules. Anything with potassium in it is going to be soluble. So this is a precipitation reaction, and you have to recognize that that's an example of a double replacement reaction. So my ions are going to switch partners. The positive lead two ion is going to hook up with the negative iodide ion. The positive lead isn't going to hook up with the positive potassium. So when they swap, keep that in mind, they're always going to swap for opposite ions because that's what they're going to be attracted to. So when Pb plus 2 and I minus 1 come together, they're going to come together in a 1 to 2 ratio and form PbI2. Now, as I try to decide whether or not this is going to stay aqueous or whether it's going to form an insoluble perspective, precipitate, I'm going to scan my list of solubility rules. And I come across iodine right here. And so I might think, ooh, that is soluble. It's up here with the soluble ions. However, there are some exceptions to compounds contain iodide. And one of those compounds is when it's paired with lead two. And so this is actually going to be an insoluble compound. That's going to be our precipitate, our solid. And then the other product, again, we're just going to pair up the other ions. They're swapping places. Now we're going to pair the positive potassium with the negative nitrate. That's going to come together in a one-to-one -one ratio, sort of KNO3. Awesome. Now, our final thing is to make sure that we've got that state of matter for that last one. And again, anything with potassium or nitrate is going to be soluble. So this last one is going to be aqueous. Your first step is to write the formulas and then come back and balance, right? And so as I look at this, I note that my nitrates and my iodides are unbalanced. And in order to bring balance to them, I need to add a coefficient of two in front of my potassium iodide to keep my number of iodides the same on each side. And I need to add a coefficient of two in front of the potassium nitrate to keep my nitrates and now my potassiums balanced as well. So my coefficients, one, two, one and two, and my states of matter, aqueous, aqueous, solid, and aqueous. Ooh, work out. That is worth three points, though. So it's an important start to much of the rest of what we're going to do in this problem. Next, subpart I, write the balanced net ionic equation for the reaction, including states. Now, I'm going to share with you the shortcut that I encourage you to use when you're writing net ionic equations. You've already done a lot of work up here in the initial formula in equation writing. So what you're gonna do for the net ionic equation is identify which of the products are your precipitate, in this case, the solid PBI2, and you're gonna write that down first. And then you're just gonna work that backwards. For the net ionic equation, we basically wanna focus in on what ions are coming together to form this solid precipitate. And in this case, it's gonna be our aqueous lead two ion and our aqueous iodide ions. 
important, you've got to make sure to include the states of matter, and you want to make sure that for the aqueous ions, you're including those charges. Okay, I'm going to pause here and jump over to a simulation so you can kind of visualize what's going on with this reaction to set us up for some of the rest of this problem. Okay, so basically what's happening here is we're mixing together potassium iodide with lead to nitrate, right? And so what's happening is they're originally aqueous, and then the lead find the iodide ions and they precipitate out, they settle to the bottom as a solid precipitate. Meanwhile, the potassium and the nitrate continue to float around as aqueous ions. Boom, precipitation reaction. That's what's happening in this problem. A little more to it, we're gonna touch base on those things now. All right, as we move to part B, it says calculate the number of moles of each reactant. So here we're gonna utilize our molarity equation and do two molarity calculations, one for each of our two reactants. The first one, the lead to nitrate, I know is 0 0.030 molar, and I know that I have 0 0.150 liters. So I've just grabbed the information in the original prompt. Next, I'll do the same setup over here for my other reactant, which is gonna be my potassium iodide. I've got 0 0.100 molar potassium iodide, and I've got 0.125 liters of it. So in each case, what I'm gonna do is just lean on my good friend calculator, and I'm gonna use my algebra skills to solve for the number of moles of each of my reactants. 0 0.030 times 0 0.150. So we've got 0 0.0045 moles of our lead to nitrate. And then over to our good friend potassium iodide here, 0 0.100 times 0 0.125 gives us 0 0.0125 moles of potassium iodide to start. Boom, one point. Boom, another point. Okay, that brings us to part C. It says, identify the limiting reactant. Show calculations to support your identification. Now, I have just already recopied my balanced chemical equation that I wrote up in part A, and I'm gonna use that and an ice table to help me identify which of these reactants is the limiting reactant. So notice how I'm kind of progressing here. I'm using part A to give my equation. I'm using my moles in part B, 0 0.0045 moles of my lead to nitrate and 0 0.0125 moles of my potassium iodide. Initially, no products formed. Now, as I try to decide which of my reactants is limiting, remember, there's a shortcut. You can take your initial number of moles of each reactant and divide by its respective coefficient. So for the lead to nitrate, divide by one. For the potassium iodide, I'm gonna divide by two whichever those resulting values is smallest is your limiting reactant. In this case, it's the lead to nitrate. And so I'm gonna subtract all of that because by definition, that is gonna get completely used up if it's limiting, but I'm gonna subtract twice that amount for the potassium iodide because it's a one to two relationship. The lead to iodide that forms is in a one to one ratio there. The potassium nitrate is in a one to two. So again, as you think about using ice tables to help you identify excess and limiting reactants, note that this change row, these numbers have to match the ratio in the balanced chemical equation. So 1, 2, 1, 2, 0 0.0045, 0 0.0090, 0 0.0045, and 0 0.0090 are in that 1 to 2, 1 to 2 ratio. Okay, so at the end, I don't have any lead to nitrate floating around as aqueous ions. I'm still going to have some of my, my potassium iodide floating around as ions because it didn't all get used up. And I will have made some precipitate. And I'll have a bunch of this potassium nitrate floating around as ions. Boom. So my ice table is a calculation to support my identification, but I need to make sure that I identify it. So my limiting reactant is lead to nitrate. Boom. All right, that brings us to part D. It says calculate the molar concentration of nitrate ion in the mixture after the reaction is complete. So again, molar concentration, molarity, molarity equals moles per liter. So I need to know what is the number of moles of nitrate and what is the volume that that nitrate is floating around in. Now, we know how much nitrate we have made. We have 0.0090 moles of potassium nitrate. 
right? That's coming up here from my ice table. I know that I know that looking at my formula for potassium nitrate, this is a one to one ratio. For every one potassium nitrate, there's one nitrate. So I have 0 0.0090 moles of nitrate floating around in solution. So I know the first part of my molarity equation, 0 0.0090 moles. Now, this is a little tricky. What total volume is that floating around in? Well, you have to remember that we mixed together 150 milliliters with 125 milliliters. So in the end, all this nitrate is floating around in the sum of those two volumes or 150 milliliters in liters and 125 milliliters in liters. So just to add those two volumes together. And that can be very tricky, especially when you're in a time situation. But now we're going to go to our good friend calculator. 0 0.0090 moles floating around in a total of 0.275 liters. And I'm just going to add that together in my calculator. Notice how I'm enclosing it in a parentheses. And that lands me with 0 0.033 molar solution. So 0 0.033 molar nitrate. Be careful with your units. Make sure that you label things correctly. It's also a great idea to put your final answer in a box. Boom, done. All right, that brings us to part E. We're asked to circle the diagram below that best represents the results after the mixture reacts as completely as possible. Now, I think it's here that it's really important to use your work from the earlier parts of this problem. First, we can recognize that this is a precipitate forming reaction. And so this one is out. I'm just going to come back to this simulation to kind of illustrate what's happening. And although I can't get the number of moles exactly, since we're working with particles here, the idea is the same. And I think it's a great way to visualize what's happening. I'm just going to make sure that I add my potassium iodide in excess. So you can kind of see what's happening here, right? The lead to nitrate is limiting. Notice that all of the lead ion is reacting and precipitating out as solid. And then kind of look at what's left, right? The potassium iodide was added in excess. So there's potassium and iodide floating around still. But notice that there's still some nitrate floating around. Even though that came from the limiting reactant, it's a spectator ion. And so it's gonna be floating around before and floating around after. So basically what we're looking for here is an image that reflects what we see on the screen. And so as we examine our remaining beakers, the only one that correctly illustrates that is this beaker here in the top right. We are missing here some of that aqueous iodide ion. So this one is gonna be out. Remember that was added in excess, and so there should be some of it still floating around as ions. It's not going to be all used up at the bottom. This one down here, for the same reason, this one's also out. We should see some aqueous, unreacted iodide ion floating around because it was added in excess. And then this last one over here, again, we're going to eliminate it. But this time we're going to eliminate it because it's indicated the incorrect precipitate. It's not the nitrate that's precipitating out. It's the iodide that's precipitating out. And so although we have got that excess potassium ion here, uh, we've got the incorrect precipitate. So this one's out as well. Boom, done. All right. And that brings us to the last part here. Will the solution in the beaker conduct electrical current? Justify your response. Okay. So first we need to answer the question. So we're going to say, yes, the solution will conduct electrical current. And then here comes our justification to make sure we get the point. Soluble ionic compounds will form mobile ions when dissolved in solution and allow for the flow of electrical current. As you come back up and either look at this image or think to the simulation, we need to have charged particles that are free to float around in solution if we're going to have an electrolyte. In this case, we do. We've got lots of leftover ions that are floating around in solution, allowing for 
the flow of electrical current. Again, here's a quick visual of what that might look like from the simulation point of view. All right, we are done. As always, if you have any questions, let me know before the test so that you feel like you're comfortable and confident on the test. Have a fantastic day.